Okay, uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Today I'm going to be talking about influence marketing and controversy surrounding this. Whether you know it or not, you're being publicly scored based on your social media content if you are active in social media networks. Some people like that idea, some people find that disgraceful. And I'm just going to present some examples to you and talk about the controversy. So before I talk about what is social media marketing, uh, influence marketing, uh, first I want to talk about mass media marketing. We're all familiar with that. So if you look at the illustration here, the person on the pedestal with a large megaphone, as you can imagine, is a mass marketer, or an advertising message being blasted out, a standardized message over television, radio, print media. In mass media, consumers do not have any control over the message. The only control they have is if they're going to turn the TV on, turn the radio on, or open up the newspaper. Other than that, if they want to enjoy the media, the entertainment on those platforms, they have to hear annoying, irrelevant, intrusive marketing communications. Now, in contrast, with social media, something I term personal media, it's a little bit different. Now, these people are all standing together in the picture here, but please imagine this is a social network. So they're not standing right next to each other, but they are connected through Facebook or Twitter or blogs or Pinterest. They're connected with their social networks. In effect, what we're seeing is ubiquitous mobile technology and easy-to-use tools where anybody can publish content. In essence, these tools are becoming more personal. Your internet-connected device is almost always with you. In fact, you can maintain connections with your personal friends, your family, your acquaintances. You are always on, always connected. And because of that, we constantly update social media. We're updating our networks, updating our status, updates, tweeting, blogging. For the most part, we enjoy that. So what we're seeing here between these two is that 20 years ago, if somebody wanted to eat out at night, let's say here in Tallahassee, they were thinking about where should they go to eat? Well, with mass media, maybe they hear a TV commercial, watch a TV commercial, hear a radio commercial, maybe they open up a newspaper, see a coupon. With personal media, it's changing somewhat. Even though brands are within personal media, they do have little advertisements off to the side, but most of us never click on those. For the most part, consumers are controlling what communication is happening within personal media. Brands are there, but they don't really control the message, at least not nearly as much as they did in mass media. So something like this is occurring. For example, the gentleman here in the red may update his Facebook status. Hey, I'd like to go out to eat tonight. Does anybody know of a good place to eat? That could be a Facebook status update. And lo and behold, his network sees that update. And the man in the green here answers him. You know, I went to Anthony's Woodfire Grill last week. Had a terrific steak, excellent service. If you're hungry, why not try that? That message resonates more with consumers than a mass media advertising or PR campaign. Because consumers trust other consumers. Brands recognize that. And they want to be, become a part of this organic interaction. Not only when the gentleman in red updates the status will he see the recommendation of Anthony's from this consumer, but other consumers, as you can see here with the green bubble and the orange bubble, they may not participate in the conversation in that they may not type an answer. They may not type a comment. But they're seeing this happen. So even though they may not want to go out and eat that night, Maybe next week they may remember that conversation. After all, consumers trust other consumers more than advertising companies, more than marketers, even more than celebrity endorsers. So with that, who is the social media influencer? And the answer is highly interactive regular people like us, average Joes, average Janes, that are highly active on social media, typically within a specific topical area that you are very familiar with. So, for example, let's take a mother, multiple children, and all her friends on Facebook knows that she's a mother. She's friends with a lot of other mothers, a lot of other fathers, and she's constantly trying different baby products, different types of diapers, creams, baby food, car seats, you name it. Her network knows that she does a lot of this, and they respect her opinion. So when she goes onto Facebook or Twitter and updates the status or tweets something about a specific product, that may be influential to some of her followers. Now, to be clear, when we're talking about who is a social media influencer, it's not anybody who's on social media. It's not people that merely have a large following, because after all, that can be easily manipulated. You can buy followers for a small amount of money if you want to increase that metric. It's a person not necessarily, uh, not necessarily that updates their statuses all the time. 
if nobody's replying or nobody's participating in the conversation. A true social media influencer is somebody who when they create content, other people respond and share that content. When you create a Facebook status update, do people click like? Do they reply with a comment? Do they tag other people? Will they reshare that? Same with blog posts, Twitter, retweets. When you create content, do other people respond? And that basically is a social media influencer. Somebody creating content, other people will share via social media, typically within topics that somebody is very familiar with, their, their personal expertise level, if you will. In effect, what this means is that influence has been democratized. This is a quote right from Mark Schaefer. He wrote a book on influence marketing called Return on Influence. And decades ago, you had $100 million ad campaigns. You had the Marlboro Man. Or, if consumers didn't trust that, we started to pay athletes. LeBron, LeBron James would have his face on a billboard right next to a shoe in the hopes that consumers, if they like LeBron, they will buy the shoe. Those forms of communication still work to a degree. However, the average Joe, the average Jane now has influence. They can persuade other consumers to make purchases, to change opinions, to change attitudes toward brands, toward products. So with that, how do brands find <coughs> social influencers? And the answer to that is that there are new emerging metrics. Companies are developing complicated algorithms. In fact, they're scoring your activity on social media. And some of the more popular companies include Clout, Cred, and Pure Index. Because we're limited on time, I'm only going to talk about Clout for the rest of this presentation. However, a lot of what applies to uh, Clout applies to these other companies as well. Each of these companies has developed their algorithms looking at multiple criteria. It's not merely how many people follow you. It's not merely if you make content, if you update content. What they're assessing is when you create content, how do other people react? Are they responding? Are they resharing your message? Are they replying? If that's the case, you will score higher on these metrics. Clout typically ranges from 1 to 100, as does Pure Index. Cred has a different scaling system. It goes up to 1,000. All right, a couple examples. Influencers and marketing campaigns. Ball Harbor Shops, an elite fashion retailer. They ran a campaign. They wanted to have, they, they wanted to have a, a fashion night out. And they were trying to figure out, who can we invite where we can get a lot of buzz? And this is an actual piece of retail signage they used. Anybody can come to the fashion night out. As long as your clock score is equal to or greater than 40. That may present a problem if my wife scores a 45 and I score a 38. Are they going to let her in and say I'm not allowed? <laughs> I see positives and negatives with something like this. Now, from a brand marketing perspective, the higher that number is for clout, that signals a brand that you create content, that content is shared, people respond to it. Meaning that if you go to the fashion show and you like what you see, there's an excellent chance you'll tweet about Ball Harbor. And if you tweet about it, your friends will reply. And when they reply, then their networks see it. And when other people reshare it, as you can imagine, it's a viral effect. More people seeing information about the brand. The negative thing is not all consumers are created equal now. In fact, let's take that a step further. You could be a loyal customer of Ball Harbor. Maybe you spent $1,000 there in the last year. But you know what? If you value your privacy, you're not active on social media, you're not going to have a score above 40. If you don't have that score, even though you're a loyal customer, even though you like the products, you would not be able to gain entry to that. So that's a bit controversial. So here's another example. Influencers and the level of service that is offered. The Palms Hotel in Las Vegas. When patrons check in there at the front desk, one of the first things that happens, the service rep, they pull up the person's cloud score. There's a couple different ways to do this. These metrics are publicly accessible, so you can go right to Cloud and query a name or Twitter somebody's, uh, uh, query somebody's Twitter handle, and you can find a score. Or what's happening is that CRM systems, it stands for Customer Resource Management Systems, they're complicated platforms that contains every piece of information a company knows about you. So your address, your phone number, your email, previous purchase history, everything they know about you. They're updating a Cloud score right in that record. In fact, it's happening automatically. A lot of these CRM platforms have deals with Cloud and Pure Index where as soon as a record is pulled up, a database call automatically calls out the Cloud or Pure Index. It pulls in your score. And in fact, when you check in to this hotel, the score is going to pop up on the screen. And if it's deemed to be high enough, the customer service rep will say, you know what? We're going to upgrade you free. A nicer suite. 
This makes sense from a branding perspective. They know that I create content. They know when I create content, other people respond to it. The message is being shared, more people are talking about it. They want to offer a higher level of service to me in the hopes that I like them, in the hopes that they exceed my expectations. That makes sense for the brand. But again, the consumer side, not all consumers are created equal. We take it a step further. My friend, his name is Jeff, he's active on social media, but not nearly as active as most people. He updates his status rarely. He has pictures of his kids, but everything is locked down. He doesn't want people to hack his information. He doesn't want people to steal his online identity or see pictures of his kids. Jeff is like a lot of people. And when I told Jeff about this, he said, great. So I spent my whole life being cautious, protecting myself, and now you're telling me because of that, some firms are not going to offer me as valuable a service or product as they'll offer you. I said, yes, that is correct. <laughs> Those are somewhat controversial. I see positives and negatives, as I explained. This one's really controversial. And I have to admit, I did not see this thing coming from this angle, and I don't know if the people that created these metrics did as well. Some companies are now using your score, your metric, to make hiring decisions. So if you're going to go interview for a job, if that job has anything to do with social media, journalism jobs, writing, because I teach marketing, marketing, advertising jobs, I know I've spoken to a lot of people in that industry, I asked them, for my undergrad students who are coming out with very little experience, what skills are you looking for for social media jobs? And I, was, I did not think that the answer would be anything with clout, but the answer was this. Well, we checked their LinkedIn profile, because we want to see if they're active, and then we immediately checked their clout score. And if their clout score is not above 35, we throw out the resume. Because some of these firms are using a clout score, peer index score, as a proxy to signify if you're active in social media, if you know how to use social media to engage, you should have a high enough score. If you don't have a high enough score, then how in the world are you going to use social media to market with brands? So you're looking at an actual screenshot here of a job that was posted online. And if you see the highlighted area, desired skills, a cloud score of 35 or higher is desired. I talked to three advertising PR companies within 50 miles of Tallahassee. They all told me that they use this to some degree. Uh, also, I went online, I found dozens and dozens of stories. So this is happening. It's not one or two little niche occurrences. I'm not saying 100% of companies do this. And I'm not saying any companies hire strictly on a metric. But it's one additional piece of information, like a GPA, or where you received your degree, or how many years experience you have. So this is playing into decisions in your everyday life. So in summary, we've entered the age of public scoring metrics. And a lot of decisions made by brands as to how they want to pursue you, a lot of decisions made by employers as to how they want to pursue you may depend on these metrics. To some, that's exciting. To some, that's a disgrace. So I created a class project. I teach electronic marketing here at Florida State University. And uh, I created, uh, created a class project after I found out firms are using this as a hiring criteria. And within that project, I basically lecture for about six weeks. I tell students how brands are using Facebook to engage with consumers, how brands use Twitter to engage with consumers, how brands can use LinkedIn, Pinterest, YouTube, various social media to engage with consumers. Then I say, OK, for the next six weeks, you're going to use your own Twitter account, your own Facebook account, your own blog if you have a blog. I don't make them create anything. But I say, I want you to try and engage your friends, your networks, with the same principles that I teach in class. Because two things are going to happen. One, you're going to learn hands-on how to apply what you learned in class. It's not just me standing in front of the room. And two, a nice secondary byproduct is that if you do this, your cloud score is going to go up. And that was a big concern for me, because I'm the only person that teaches this type of marketing. And if my students go for a job, and by the way, the students on average had about a cloud score of 15 to 20, 25, which means all my students, no matter how great they were, most of them would never get past that initial interview screen. But, if they're going to depend on me to educate them, I thought this was important. When I created this project, I told a popular uh, syndicated blogger named Mark Schaefer, and he wrote a book I'll show you in a moment called Return on Influence. I told him about my project. He invited me to write a guest blog post for his syndicated blog. I did, and I received mixed reaction. I was, I was shocked, number one, at how popular it became. A lot of positive reaction, a lot of negative reaction. A lot of people dislike these metrics. And because I was teaching college students, I was called a redneck. I was called, uh, I had no pride as an academic, I should be ashamed of myself, I'm full of BS, 
One person said, you know, any school that lets a professor teach this is a type of school where you can get in by applying a postcard. <clears throat> NYU does something similar, Northwestern, along with Florida State University, those are some pretty, uh, pretty strong <coughs> academic institutions. So, but that touches on the nerve, is that if you're a discounter, if you love deals, if you love being active in social media, you may love this. You may love this idea. If you're private, if you think it's unfair that you have almost like a public credit, uh, credit card like score, credit score, that's being compared, some people find that uh, discriminatory. They don't like that. So basically, you're all being scored. You're all being sorted, ranked, categorized. And at one point or the other, it's going to affect your purchase decisions, your level of purchase, your employment opportunities, and many other opportunities. If you found this topic interesting, I invite you to peruse this book. It's called Return on Influence. You can buy it online, very inexpensive, $15, $20 on Amazon. It's written by Mark W. Schaefer. Mark is an adjunct faculty member at Rutgers. He teaches social media marketing. He also runs a syndicated blog. And he knows a heck of a lot about social media. I consider him one of the elite social media marketing experts. Thank you.